we thought this would be a great, um, great topic. So I'm going to introduce to you Bethany Chambers, all the way from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, she is the Director of Audience Engagement at North Coast Media. And uh, you know, she does champion product development and content strategy and you know, making sure they've got a good client relationship um, and boosting up digital revenue within our organization. And she was actually one of Folio's top women in media. So I'm going to let Bethany take it away, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Roberta. This is Bethany, and hi, everyone. Um, that was a great lead-in uh, to the presentation because I am going to talk a little bit about video um, live streaming and definitely about social influencers, So, because um, those are all key to getting your content shared. Um, these slides got a little bit squished, so if you have trouble reading them, I'll make sure that the PDF version is easier to read. Um, essentially, I, this is a presentation for anyone who creates, manages, or monetizes content. So, so in a lot of cases, I'm sure you're like myself where you're doing a little bit of all three um, and trying to bring some new ideas to you. So I gave a presentation that was similar to this at BIMS. Um, there are going to be a few new memes and a few new tools in here from the BIMS presentation. So uh, if you saw that one, you can hold tight for 30 minutes. See, there are going to be a few new items in here as well. Um, really the thing we're looking at is, is showing that to create the differences between interesting content and boring content, you really don't have to be worrying about creating clickbait, um, and that you can create interesting content in a B2B setting in a way that is almost as easy as it is for a blog of for millennial consumers like an Elite Daily out there. Um, so just it's about considering these kind of nine main tools. And I'm really only going to have time here today to talk about seven of nine of those tools, uh, but you'll have the notes on all of them. So um, you can go back through them at your leisure. Um, so one of the things that, uh, just a brief introduction to North Coast Media, we are new to Connective. In 2017 we joined. Uh, we're a B2B based in Cleveland, Ohio, and we have six disparate industrial and services markets that we serve. Uh, but we're a five-year-old startup, so we bring that same startup approach to our brands, although all of our brands are, uh, are very old. We have uh, several that are uh, approaching a century and one that is 102 years old this year. Um, so I've been with North Coast Media for five years since uh, its inception. Okay, before that, I was with Advanced Star. And I started out as a newspaper reporter, and I really bring the same kind of approach that I uh, had as a newspaper reporter to being a, an audience engagement manager. And that's really just having that nose for news, a desire to investigate, to dig into the code, to dig into the tools that other websites are using, and to make things interesting for people. So um, well, before I was writing about wildfires, now I'm putting out a few fires at a, in a more of an office setting. And so what makes content shareable? I think there's some really key things that can come out of this, and this is an animated GIF uh, um, usually, but really GIFs are things that make things shareable, memes uh, like this, hashtags like you see here, and celebrities like Kermit the Frog. Um, and your celebrities we'll talk about in a minute, but you do have some celebrities in your markets regardless of uh, how niche you get. The right mix of your content um, is going to be really important to making sure it gets shared. So make sure you have mixed media that involves a multimedia approach to all of the things that you're sharing and not just text. Um, it really, uh, our look, when we look at our social media feeds, we really kind of think of a three-part mix to what we're posting daily and when we look back weekly and monthly. Um, that we want to have original content, which would be reporting, uh, our original reporting, our news pieces, uh, features that come from our magazine. Our community component is going to be a lot of aggregated and curated content from movers and shakers in the business. And then the personality side is really kind of pulling back the curtain and allowing your audience to see um, a little bit more about who you are and who the people are that are producing the content on their website or in their magazine that they're reading all of the time. Um, so again, here's, a, here's a showing you our Golfdom Twitter feed. Golfdom is a magazine a brand that's celebrating its 90th anniversary this year, and it's for golf course superintendents and general managers. We have 8,000 Twitter followers, so it's a very niche industry, uh, and still not, you know, not a huge account. Uh, but the, the fee we have is uh, highly engaging. Uh, average, I think last I read, was Twitter engagement is roughly about 1.64% um, is the typical average engagement on a post. Our Golfdom Twitter feed is running about 5.39%, so well above the average. Um, and I think really that's a testament to following that strategy, that three-part strategy for content. So while I think Roberta brought up a really good point about kind of really re-evaluating our strategies for social media for 2018, ours is very simplistic, and maybe there's some need for us to probably dig into that deeper. But on the simple view, the first part of our component is always that original content. That's our OG. That's the stuff that's been um, the lifeblood to our magazine for 90 years. And you see we won't use a lot of hashtags for this, and this will drive traffic back to our website. The next part of that is going to be those personality tweets. And I really think of it as our editor-in-chief is our Kardashian. 
So uh, you may not have a Kermit the Frog, but you have your version of it. And that's the, the only two things that requires is to um, have a, an editor-in-chief who's willing to be gracious and to put themselves out there. And in this case, Seth is awesome at that because he is running his own Twitter feed, and then we are regularly retweeting uh, his content on the Golfsum feed and vice versa. That allows us to take the brand and use a first-person point of view. Um, and in this case, uh, this was a huge contest we ran at the, in the fall where he, we bought a keg and Seth has a classic car and already road trips around the country visiting uh, golf courses. So he visited the association uh, chapter with his keg um, that had the most responses to his annual State of the Industry survey for editorial. And then another component that we have here is our, um, your modified tweets or your mentioned tweets and your retweets. I think this is a really great opportunity for you to share, again, the information and the opinions of your influencers in your industry. Um, and in some cases, those are going to just be kind of average Joes. In fact, some of the most polarizing content that we've shared has been stuff that came from people who um, the, the comments that people gave back were, well, he's just like me. And some people saw that positive, and some people saw it as a negative and said, well, why, what's his special thing, and why did you choose him to go to his information? Um, this is also a really great way to handle difficult topics. So for instance, one of these tweets here that we um, retweeted with some comments was regarding H2B visa programs. So again, we don't necessarily want to have a perspective or have a, an opinion in that race uh, as an editorial brand. Um, but at the same time, we know that our audience is doing this, gives us an opportunity to open that debate and open that um, conversation uh, without necessarily putting ourselves in a position where we have to make uh, a choice or take sides. And then a uh, next component of really great shareable content is going to be chunking your stories. And if you attended any of the conferences or um, webinars or educational webinars or anything in the, in the last year, you've heard this term probably ad nauseum. Um, chunking is, is just the hot way of saying make sure that you utilize DEX, subheads, keywords in your content, whether you're writing that for print or whether you're writing that for web. So um, one of the things you'll see, this is a, our editor-in-chief on our landscape management brand does a really good job of this naturally and has been doing this really well on our print magazine for a long time. And that makes the job of the people on the digital side so much easier. And that also makes it easier for your audience to share content. So uh, this was a cover story from the magazine. You could see how it was shared then on our website and how it appeared on the website. It had sidebars, subheads, deck, etc. And then when we go to share it on social media, it's structured such that it's really easy to pick it up and share it. And it allows you to modify the voice or modify um, which parts of the you know, story that you want to share or think are going to be most uh, appropriate to your audiences on your various different social media platforms, but in the fastest way possible. So one thing I will say about this is if you had asked me five years ago, I would have said, for the love of God, do not share one article just across all of your platforms at once. That's a crazy idea. Um, but we are at a place now where platform stratification has truly taken hold. People have picked their favorites, and they are sticking with those favorites. So um, you know, maybe you're one of those people, I'm one of those people who's not doing much Facebook anymore personally, but I still do a lot of Twitter and Instagram. So I'm going to expect to see um, you know, my posts or get my news through Twitter and Instagram. Um, another thing that will really help you in sharing your content or making your content shareable for your audience is picking the formulas that already work for you. And you can just go straight into your Google Analytics or your um, whatever your analytics platform is that you're using, your Parsley um, that you might have, Chartbeat, and see what kind of your top articles are. So here's a list of top articles all time on our pest management professional website. And you can see that they do kind of follow a, a very specific topic, a, a very specific formula for success. But one of them that I picked out is that very last one, which was from 2017. And we had a series that were in the top 20. Um, they were all 2017. They were an interview with series where our editors from pest management came up with this really creative idea of interviewing pests. So they made it seem like they were doing a Q&A but with a bug and really got into very detailed um, creative perspective of a bug's life essentially. And I think the most important thing that came out of that, which is, which is there were a couple kind of big things, but the big important thing for us was that it showed that you can really humanize anything and that by humanizing it makes it highly shareable. And these were some of our uh, best performing posts on the website for the year and all time, and then also for social media. Now interestingly enough, we tried using them in print, and our editor-in-chief said they just didn't get the same kind of traction through print. Um, so again, it's about understanding your audience and what their needs are. And maybe that was a level of creativity or a level um, you know, a little bit outside the box, uh, too much for the average uh, magazine reader. Again, formulas for success that we follow 
that tend to work across all of our brands are how-to stories, fun facts, people. And I think that's also the low-hanging fruit if you think about it. People, um, if you're looking for content to fill your blog or to fill your, uh, your social media feed, posting about people's job changes is uh, the easy stuff to come by. It comes straight from press releases. You're, you're probably seeing it pretty regularly. Um, but it also gives you an opportunity. To, that tends to be our most shareable content because people want to share when they've changed a job or gotten a promotion. Uh, and then fun facts are things where you can really just kind of resurface facts every so often, um, based, especially if you can pick out a news peg. So for instance, the rats could produce nearly half a billion descendants in three years if left unchecked. So you're welcome for the nightmares that I've just created for you. And then uh, just a brief aside about content marketing versus editorial content. That's really just a boring fight. It's as boring as Mayweather Pacquiao. Um, you, really want to think, you really want to think of them as su supplementing each other and serving each other in a way that you can drive traffic between your content marketing content, the, thing, the projects that you're doing for your clients or for your advertisers, and between um, and your editorial content. It's really the same as your print and your digital platforms. We got past that fight a long time ago. Let's get past the content marketing editorial fight. Um, this is an example again from Pest Management Professional. We ran a tweet, uh, of a news story, and then it was a top tweet uh, about a Bay Air program that they were doing in Uganda to fight chiggers and to stop uh, the spread of malaria among children in Uganda. It was very well received. It was great, and ended up being great PR for Bay Air um, based on this news story. And because of that, they decided to run a print advertorial and really flesh out um, a, a longer story where they, we interviewed the. Um, the Good Samaritans who were involved with this program with Bayer, and it didn't talk at all about their products. It talked about, um, about really about the children. You can see pictures of actual kids who were, whose lives were saved from it. And again, that's, that's social media driving to print, and it's content or it was editorial driving to content marketing, um, so that they can really work hand in hand. And then just knowing your platforms is really going to assist you with making this process a lot easier. Um, so these are some of our kind of best practices and rules of thumb that we've found across uh, North Coast Media six brands. And as, as I said, we're in kind of six disparate markets, so um, you, you got to uh, appreciate that these are going to differ a little bit by each brand. In fact, I was working some on Twitter just this week, and I saw we had one brand that was doing best with posts on weekdays 12 to 2, and another that was doing great with uh, weekdays uh, from 2 to 4. It, so it's not just weekends that do well on Twitter. Um, and Facebook is one that I think is really interesting to remember your calls to action. I was working with a client on one of their uh, sponsored Facebook posts. And uh, your calls to action are really especially critical on Facebook now that we know that they're changing the, the way they put things in their news feed or potentially even moving publisher content out of news feeds. Um, so if you're working on your organic post, you want to make sure that it's going to be highly shareable and commentable in order for it to appear uh, well on your news feed. So, and a post I happened to look at did not do well in part because it had too much information in the post itself and didn't have a great call to action. Um, it really seemed that while it had a great number of impressions and shares, um, that perhaps a lot of people didn't click through to read more about this, um, this advertorial content or content marketing piece because they felt like they had gotten what they needed to out of it. And you can utilize all kinds of tools to find out what the new trends are in the platforms. So your connective newsletter is a really great place for that. Uh, Instagram, I wanted to bring up Instagram in particular because the nostalgia economy is, is uh, one thing that I think we're going to see a lot of playing into our content in 2018. Uh, if you uh, have read the Quartz Obsession e-newsletter, I'm obsessed with that e-newsletter, but they did a really great job of digging into why the nostalgia economy is um, so trendy right now. But we had seen that already on our Pitt and Quarry brand. This is for above ground mining, the aggregate business. So it's a very niche market. It's, uh, it tends to be a little bit older, excuse a little bit older. And while we saw in a lot of our markets, the, face, the Flashback Friday and the Throwback Thursday, so your FBS and your TBTs were really losing steam over the last couple of years, consider how long that's been going on, uh, those hashtags have trended. Uh, we did not see that on Pitt and Quarry. And I think that really play, plays into a testament of the nostalgia economy, but also um, I saw Linda Boff speak at Content Marketing World. She's a CMO from GE, and I think she put it best when she said it's the nobility of big machines and that they, GE strives to use social media to bring big machines to their audiences. And we do the same with Pitt and Corey. And in fact, our only viral posts of the year, the ones that got 300,000 plus shares, uh, which is huge for our, small, for our small brands, were these Pitt and Quarry throwback pictures. One was a picture from uh, 1918. So that turned out to be kind of a, a really good segue for us because now we can utilize that social media to, to drive back to content for print and for digital. Uh, and we're going to try to see what we can dredge up about these people and about this uh, particular uh, 
quarry that were in this picture that was in this picture from 1918, since it's the 100th anniversary of that. And then also making sure that you're utilizing your social media platforms to drive traffic to each other, not just to your website. I think it's been traditional thinking that we always want to just drive to our website, especially for those of you who are like us who are very ad funded. Um, that's really important. But the more we move into a content marketing based approach, um, and the more we uh, understand the importance of our audiences being uh, getting what they need to get on the platform they need to get it out of, I think we'll see that going between social media platforms works. And again, with the Facebook changes, being able to bring people from one platform to another will, will probably really assist you in getting your organic content shared on Facebook. So this is, a, a, uh, again, an interesting example of content marketing becoming editorial content in the pest management market. We, this was a content marketing Twitter campaign, a video campaign that we did with a client uh, for their university to train pest management professionals to uh, eradicate homes of bed bugs. Uh, the post did really well. The video got a lot of shares and information, uh, a lot of comments, and it ended up being shared over to a private exclusive group on Facebook. It's so exclusive I can't join it, but I can just take a screenshot of their header for you, um, but for owners of pest management companies. And where it got so much, uh, so much play and so much uh, interest that the content marketing company, or the company we were working with to do this content marketing campaign ultimately got way more leads than they could ever use for their small university um, and had to pull back from the campaign. So talk about unintended consequences of, of good sharing or things that seemingly go viral. Um, if I had the great answer to how to handle other companies' leads, I would give that to you. But maybe one of you guys can provide me with that idea. Uh, but basically, the, the one thing I want you to keep in mind is that if you build it, they will come is not a philosophy that's going to take you anywhere anymore. It's not an effective strategy. You need to know your audience, and you need to find your audience and go to them. So uh, again, most of you I, on the line are working for companies that are like us, where we're in a variety of different markets. We try to treat each market uh, differently and independently. You can see this compares our landscape market to our LP gas, which is our propane market for publications. Uh, we are constantly tracking best times and days to post so that we make the best out of our small team and we maximize our efficiencies. Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at. And then we're also treating each platform differently. And again, I think this is a really good thing uh, to point out that you know, I, a lot of our team, my team has definitely grown a lot in the last five years. We went from being a one-person team to uh, being a nine-person team with two more positions open for 2018. But um, one of the things, though, that we find, though, is that with all these different platforms, we really have to pick, be choosy about where we're going to put our time and our efforts. So we want to make sure that we're choosing the right ones and that we're selecting based on the audiences and based on the data. So again, this is an example. So you saw the LP gas is best time to post is at 11 a.m. I know their best day of the week is Monday because they tend to look a lot for market reports when the markets reopen at the beginning of the week. Um, and then when we look at platforms, we can also then separate those out by uh, gender and by age and make sure that we get the right voice and the right kind of content or the right approach to the content on each of the platforms that we share to. Um, in this case with LPGAS, we're sharing to Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and, um, and the, the website, uh, but not utilizing Instagram or LinkedIn at this point. And then we're also looking for good data to be the, really the driver of everything, not big data. We're a small company. Um, we have a small, you know, we have to have a, a really kind of a scrum approach to all of the projects that we do where we're working as a team. Um, so we, if we were to just get bogged down on all of the data we have, I don't know that we would really get a lot accomplished. So uh, I think a really great approach for that has, for us has been to look for what we can use. So we're utilizing um, the Knowledge Marketing Unified Audience Database that I know several of you guys are. And this is just kind of showing you how when we went live with it, all of a sudden we really started to be able to see um, how our website audiences played in. And this was in our first, uh, first months of tracking. Um, how This is a smaller website audience for us, but we saw that it was very heavily crossed over with our other platforms, which was good to know. And also really important for us in heavily regulated industries that we work in, uh, we don't really want to see a lot of unknown website traffic um, because we want to make sure that we're giving the, this kind of professional information to the professionals. Um, so you can utilize your circulation database, your email database for that. Um, we have our Omita circulation database and then our email database with knowledge marketing. But you also have all of the extra insights that you can get from your social media platform. So if you're not digging into those readily, um, or if your team is digging into those, but you're maybe not always seeing those numbers, it's a great idea to step in and get yourself logged in sometime, uh, because I think it helps you to get a better impression of how some of those uh, different platforms differ by audience as well. And then also don't, don't discount the qualitative sources. Um, interviewing and doing face-to-face -face analysis and roundtables and discussions are a really great opportunity to give 
a voice to the stuff that you might be seeing in the data. And I've been doing some interviews on the pit and quarry market ahead of some presentations in the next couple weeks. And I have to say it's been fascinating to hear about why people left email and wanted to – now they get all of their news from Facebook. Um, maybe it's also added some interesting insight to me about how people consume all of their news, not just their professional news, but uh, it's, been really, it's been a really enlightening approach. And so I'm going to go through now um, a few tools that you can use because there's a lot of great tools out there. I can't go through all of these. I can't demo these now, but if anybody wants a demo, um, you can get my phone number right here off the platform or um, email address and we can connect and I can take you through any of them. But a few of my favorites, uh, Canva is awesome because you can create your, your graphics right there on your mobile phone. I was traveling to a conference in Louisville. I was in the car. Um, I knew I needed to be promoting a meet and greet with the Editor-in-Chief. We had a tweet up coming up uh, with the Editor-in-Chief the next day, and I needed to get some graphics up. All I had to do was put it together right there on my phone and post straight to Twitter. And voila, I'm done. I didn't have to get my laptop out. I'm not trying to get my MiFi working. Um, it's, it was all on my phone. Uh, MemeGenerator.net, there's a ton of meme generators, but that's my personal favorite one. Again, perfect for uploading whatever image you have and slapping your uh, impact style font straight onto it. And again, you can do that on mobile and on desktop. One I mentioned at BIMS, if you had this list, so update your list, is Storify. I was an early adopter of Storify. I loved that back in 2010. Um, unfortunately, it bit the dust last month, so um, it no longer exists. Essentially, it allowed you to aggregate all of a, different, a bunch of different social media platforms in one place and then pull up a post created on that, which was great for tracking everything. But I think so many of us nowadays just use an embed code straight from Instagram or Twitter to post to the website, our websites that Storify probably had lost its – um, relevancy in the market. So, um, so that one's gone. But a couple others too, if you're not in a content creator position, you're doing m primarily management at this point. Um, Infogram and Easily are two that I utilize a lot for giving an infographic to reports that I'm providing to other managers or to um, other departments. Infogram is great because it gives you an opportunity to give an interactive. So if I'm updating, maybe so we have new circulation numbers or a new approach to our, um, our audit, for instance. Um, I could put those together with the little peg people and point out you know, how these fit together and create an infographic that way. I've utilized that for doing analyses of um, advertiser spend compared with e-newsletters to print and figuring out which advertisers are um, more likely to have a larger investment in digital. Um, and easily as one is awesome for putting, putting together process charts. So a, a really a flow chart of uh, content. So we started for 2018, we started a success managers program uh, where we have a dedicated account, account manager essentially to the success of a larger um, digital campaign or content marketing campaign. As we've had more of those, we've seen a need for that. Um, and this created the process chart to show exactly where different things need to happen um, throughout the campaign's life uh, with us. So those are two that are great. And they're also nice because they're interactive. But in addition to being interactive, I often then will screen, share, uh, will screen record them util utilizing QuickTime and then upload them to easygift.com and turn them into an animated GIF. And uh, I think a lot of people really enjoy a good animated GIF in their email. So if you wanted to share a process chart, you don't want to have to give somebody to log in, and you don't want them to be messing around with it themselves, you want to point out a few things um, yourself, then you can make a, a GIF from any of those as well. And then CritSpark is one that I also I mentioned, I think at BIMS we had recently started use, using it. Uh, we did end up signing on for a year with them because we saw, again, on that Pit and Quarry, we saw a record engagement in Pit and Quarry because of utilizing their quizzes and surveys. It's an outcome quiz style that you can do on BuzzFeed, um, that you would see on BuzzFeed, but that you can also do with your B2B audience. And so the quiz, Are You Crushing It at Crushing?, uh, which is, uh, you know, a little rock humor for people in the Pit and Quarry audience uh, was uh, very highly performing for us. And I think you would probably see the same as well with some of yours. And then again, this is the thing that points out exactly what Roberta was saying before. If you have video, it's way more likely to be shared on Twitter. This is a HubSpot metric, but six times more likely to be shared. And then uh, a few tools, I won't really get into these ones, but just write them down to check out later. Again, these are all for identifying trends. Um, right tag is a personal favorite. And then some ones I just added that are new. These are um, some tools that you can get on your Firefox browser. And Firefox switched to Quantum, so maybe if you had some browser plugins, you lost a few. But these are three that are still working on Quantum, so keep that in mind. Um, KeepVid is one that I utilize a lot. It allows you to download a video from pretty much any social media platform, save it to your desktop, and then you could reload that to another platform. It happens all the time where I'm working with like a content marketing partner. 
um, and they say, well, so, you know, a former contractor posted this to my YouTube account. I don't have the raw file, but I really, really like to do a Twitter campaign right now. You can download with KeepVid for free at 720p, which is perfect for social media, um, and, and it's as simple as that. SEO Quake is one I found out about from the SIPA newsletter. Um, Nate at, at Medlean Media uh, had emailed with Ron Levine, and I think, Ron, you're on here today, uh, but they hit with some ideas regarding SEO Quake after seeing the presentation at BIMS. And this is a, one I've really started to utilize a lot because it gives you page rank on Google, Bing, and Alexa, and also an opportunity to compare URLs, and you can do it straight there in the browser. And then one more is Page Saver. It allows you to save a screenshot of your entire page at one time. So just watch out for your step. This is really just an oppor you know, opportunity to remember to check your assumptions at the door um, for some of the kind of things that will kill your content. In fact, I was just reading Harvard Business Review had a really great post uh, earlier this month. I read it last night about self-awareness. It's a quiz for self-awareness. I did not take that quiz before talking here today. Uh, I didn't want to have it uh, hanging over my head, but it said that the, the least self-aware people in the business organization are senior managers. Um, because they're less <laughs> likely to be challenged by the people above them or the people below them. Uh, so I'm definitely going to take that, that quiz, and I encourage all of you to do the same and ho hopefully utilize that with some tools to make sure that I'm doing the best for my team and for the company. Um, and then make sure you're utilizing benchmarking. I'm one of the kind of people who creates a lot of great content and feels really excited about it and then gets totally bummed out when no one's tweeting about it and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, you really utilize that benchmarking to avoid that Dis disappointment, which is a wedge between expectation and reality. And to keep your standards high, and again, this is one where I would say it's really important to hold your standards of your content marketing programs to the same standards as of your editorial programs and vice versa. So we had two webinars here, one in 2016 and one in 2017. One in 2016, they were the same sponsor, same kind of topic. Uh, one in uh, 2016 was, had higher registration. Uh, the one in 2016 had slightly higher um, slightly higher live attendance. Our registration conversion was identical for both at about 50%. The questions asked were identical for both at about 30, and the time was identical for both about 50 minutes. And uh, the one on the left was a content marketing event, and one on the one on the right was an editorial event. So good content is good content. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, created by your editorial team for your audience or created by your content marketing team or by your partners for your audience. And then also test and improve. And I think this is one where I realize that everyone in your organization, regardless of where they are and what position they're in, um, has an ability to help you out with the testing and improving your content. And Allison that you see a picture of here is a willing test subject and has been the person who has always volunteered and come up with these the kind of A-B tests that she wants to run and things that she wants to do. So uh, late last year she came up with the idea of doing uh, testing our from lines because uh, because of the supposition that we were utilizing more generic from lines that if we changed them to our editor-in-chief's names, that we would have better engagement. And she was right. Um, we did it on three brands, on the GPS World brand where we went from the editors of GPS World to a from line that had Alan Cameron, editor and publisher. We saw a, per a percentage increase every single week that we did this. And the only brand where we saw a very, uh, very small uptick instead of a large one was one where we had a new editor-in-chief. So uh, as an influencer, probably just doesn't ha his name just didn't have quite the same uh, impact. But we, I bet if we run that test again in the future, we'll see a, a change to that as well. And then just to remember uh, to create that strategy and constantly be reassessing how you're handling things. And actually, Roberta, I got this idea, I think, for the one in the middle here from you because you created a really great month-by-month -month, um, breakout chart that showed how the campaigns would work. And you can utilize this for editorial and for content marketing, which I think is the best part of it. So it's not, this isn't any kind of fancy project management or strategy software, although I have, I'm definitely looking at some of those to make our lives easier. You can do all of this with Excel. And then just one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, about Snapchat, since it is still a really hot topic. Uh, most of us aren't on Snapchat Discover yet, although I know they are kind of opening the doors to more and more publishers every day on Snapchat Discover. Um, what was once the hottest, the hottest club in town was what Forbes called Snapchat in 2015. In 2018, I think it's really a big question mark. But I think it's a great place to start uh, dip, dipping your toes into if you're not already. Um, you can sponsor a filter, which, like, which is what North Coast Media did at BIMS. Um, you can use it to do behind the scenes or show coverage. So it's not something that I think you need to be doing every day, unlike this, what this is screenshot showing you here. Uh, but it is something that you could be doing maybe during special times or key peak times of the year. And Snapchat knows, uh, Wall Street agrees with you, it's confusing. It's definitely not, uh, its interface has shown that with studies that it's not really 
uh, adaptable for uh, an audience that's over 35, but check back in 2018 because they are undergoing several different uh, renovations and facelifts to their user interface right now to make it more usable. So that's what I got to uh, talk about here today, but I'll take any kind of questions that anybody has. Um, and otherwise, we'll be handing off to talk about Google Chrome next. Great, great topic. Great, great job. Thanks so much. Any Excellent. questions? Just a reminder, yeah, folks, if you, have a specific, if you have a specific question for Bethany, just unmute your line by hitting star 7. Right now, we're going to unmute everyone for the next discussion on Google Chrome. <clears throat> this is Justin. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. So um, just leading into the next topic um, for today, um, I wanted to give everyone just a quick overview and have a quick discussion with the group about Google Chrome. So what we're talking about here today, in case anyone isn't aware, um, there was an announcement last year, it was actually last June, uh, from Google basically saying that Google is going to be releasing updates to the Chrome browser starting on February 15th of this year, so there's another month before this actually happens. And basically the changes that are coming into play is that um, Google is basically making a, a stab, a nice attempt at taking a, uh, an effort of cleaning up a lot of the ads being served on webs that are failing compliance. And when we're talking about compliance, we're talking about compliance with something that Google calls the better ads standards. And in case anyone doesn't know what this is, let's see, maybe actually this would be helpful. I'm going to paste a link in our chat. I don't know, if Matt, if you can um, um, send this. I'm going to put it into the, the chat and put it in here. But I think this is a good way for people to get a sense of what we're talking about because it's a very simple infographics that really kind of very straightforward, plain and simple point out what Google is trying to do, which is that they're looking at taking, you know, I think in the last few years, especially for anyone who's worked online for a while, the you know, ads have gotten out of control. Right? They've really sort of hit a point where advertisers are completely taking advantage, dominating the space. And unfortunately, it's really ruining the web experience as a whole. I mean, there's tons of webs, uh, um, websites out there that kind of fall into this category. But what Google basically did is said, look, we're starting this coalition. We're basically going to get a list of ads that are breaking what we think are the right experiences for users on the web. And there's a nice list here for anyone who can't see that link. It's basically just some simple infographics and you know, just to show you guys literally which ads they're talking about on, on web and mobile. Um, but for most people on the web experiences, the ads that we're talking about are, are pop-up ads. Um, Auto-playing video ads is another one that's high on their radar. Um, pre ads that kind of count down. I think if you guys are frequent users of like the New York Post or anything like that, you know what I'm talking about where you go look at a website and there's a giant ad covering the entire page. It counts down for 10 seconds and you're kind of left there staring at your screen and you can't do anything about it. And um, you know, really large sticky ads, I could think of a lot of ads that do this too, that kind of take up big blocks on the page and cover half the, the, the browser. But these things are really kind of ruining the web experiences. And I think what Google is making an attempt at doing is rather than having a lot of savvy users go off on their own and use ad blockers, which, which really would kind of deteriorate performance of advertisement on the web in general if, if ad blockers became too dominant. You know, Google's making a stab at saying, look, you know, what we really want to do is get the industry aligned again. It's really gotten out of control. Technology's gotten better and people are really kind of destroying the web experiences. And basically in another month they're going to start to flag sites, which is sort of the next step here of in case anyone is running into this problem like we are here, you know what, what my company is doing here is strategic insights because obviously we have a lot of sites that are ad driven sites. They're completely free. And we're basically going through our ad campaigns that are being sold for this year, and we're course correcting immediately with our sales teams, especially on things that we know are abusive and that really shouldn't be you know, on our site. And the one for us anyway that comes into um, you know, a relevant source is, is pop-up ads because we do this a lot in our sites where we have welcome ads, things popping up for users. And what we really don't want to happen is people who come in via Chrome getting flagged. And the way you can get ahead of this so there's a little bit of a curve here and a little time left in case anyone's interested in seeing, you know, is my site, you know, going to be impacted here? What's the potential impact? What's really going to happen? So for anyone here who has um, a team that's working with uh, Google Analytics, you know, specifically Google Webmaster Tools, um, in the last few months there's been a tool that's been released within the Google Webmaster Suite, um, and basically it's called the Ad Experience Report. 
So for anyone familiar with Google Webmasters, I'd, I'd recommend logging in and taking a look at the options that they have there. And you'll find that there's a new tool listed there. It's called the Ad Experience Report. And what you could do is if you have a site that's already been registered with Google, and there's a process to verify your site, you could just simply add a piece of HTML code to it. If you go through your Webmaster tools, you'll kind of go through that process of just adding a file to verify it. And what Google will basically do is give you a rating. It will basically tell you if your site is at risk or not. And I highly recommend for anybody out there who's, you know, who thinks they might have some ads that break these rules, you should go ahead and go into your Webmaster Tools, get these reports run, and take a look at what the warnings are. And the process that Google has here is that they're not going to start blocking sites or anything right away. What Google is going to do is basically give everybody a 30-day warning so that come February 15th, if your site is running these ads and Google does feel that you're having a negative experience to your users, um, you'd want to run this report. You'd want to get a list of these ads that Google is flagging and you know, within a 30-day period remove those ads from your network before they do start to impact traffic or get flagged in any worse way. Um, and, hey, Justin, uh, you know, like, yeah. it's, it's Roberta. So I, I'll just mention to everybody, we, we did one of our websites. We, we got a warning already. So it's coming your way, guys. Um, does, uh, does, the, um, does the rating take into account that you can, set, uh, you, know, you can set filters so that ads only pop up once a day or once a week? That's right. Or That's right. all pop-ups in general? So I think a lot of it is unknown. You know, because it hasn't happened yet, I think there's a lot of people who have that same question, Roberto, like they're kind of nervous. Like I can only speak for my sales teams. They're nervous, like what's going to happen here, Justin? But, you know, my recommendation is, you know, you just want to stay on top of it. I think that thresholds do make a difference personally. So if you had an ad that only popped up once per day or once per week or some threshold that wasn't really impacting the experience, I think that would be reflected in the Google report come February 15th. So I think there's going to be a lot of people eager to see you know, what those thresholds are like. And I think the next 30 days afterwards is going to be a lot of experimental development going on throughout the industry of people trying to get this working right. And I think this would be a great follow-up talk, you know, topic for us too of, you know, companies that have had this problem and what they did to resolve it, you know, what issues can we see or expect if we do, you know, have issues that are flagged. Um, you know, for now though, I think the best route would be just to just to see what you've got there, take a look and see what is flagged, you know, from Google and um, you know, for now my recommendation would be is just take a look at your inventory. You know, if you have ad units that are being consistently sold throughout the year and they continue to be sold, you know, you might want to look at your, your media kit and see if this is something your team continues should be selling, if it's really going to hurt the experience, and if you just want to start investing in other things on your site that maybe you can make up some of this revenue if there's any loss. But that would be my recommendation is really just to do exactly what you said, Roberta. Go through your Webmaster Tools, run it, see what Google says about your ads, and see how many ads are being flagged. And then initially start playing with thresholds to see if that makes a difference. And if it doesn't, you know, consider removing it completely from your network. And I do expect that there will be things that will just go away from the web for the better, right? Like speaking from a web user perspective and not my company perspective, I mean, sites out nowadays are, are really out of control with ads. I mean, the experience really is getting worse and worse. The mobile experience kind of continues to get a little worse with things covering the entire screen. And they really need to have some regulation to it. So I am glad that you know, there is some stab at making this a better experience. Otherwise, a lot of people would do what I do as a developer, which is I just block all ads and I don't deal with it. And that's really not, not good for anybody. But, you know, I think unless they go this route and start to force these issues, you know, eventually you get to a point where no one can see any of your ads and the whole, the whole industry kind of tanks. So um, it sounds like question. they're it's on the right road. Yeah, go Did for it. Did you read anything about, um, I think it was on mobile that the um, – the overlay, like before you get to the article, there might be an overlay, that mm -hmm. it has to be covering 75% of the, of the screen. Have you read anything about like percentages of viewability on the content at all? No, the only thing that they've listed, at least here on what I'm following here on the, their standard site, this is what I'm kind of, this is Google's obviously link for us to, to follow of what they're kind of using. And the only actual percentages were, you know, that on mobile anyway, at least the one I'm looking at here, is that they don't really want ad density higher than 30% on the page. They don't really want ads covering you know, 85% of the page for, you know, any duration of time. They really want to keep things to a bare minimum. 
But I think, you know, like, like you said, Roberta, I think in the next 30 days after this happens, there'll be a lot of lessons learned from people. So for me, I'm just anxious to see the fallout and, and, you know, making sure that we're taking as much precaution as necessary. Even on the development side, you know, my thought is, you know, we're kind of actually changing our development roadmaps. I'm kind of leaving a little extra time for my team come February 15th for the unknown because I'm expecting there to be some emergency kind of things that we need to do. So, you know, that's kind of what we're doing to prepare for it, just keeping resources aligned, know that it's coming, run your webmaster you know, script and see if you can get any initial kind of results to see how bad it might be. And um, you know, if you know you're running these abusive ads, you know, take action now. And I, I would also encourage you not even just to look at ads, right? So from a, we have a lot of uh, little pop-up windows that come up just for newsletter sign-up or to promote our own webinar or um, so I think it's kind of taking a look at your business in total, and you might need to be reaching out to other parts of the organization just to confirm, like, do you have anything out there? Um, you know, yeah. sometimes people use tools, right, that allow you to kind of, hey, let's quick, uh, you know, let's do a quick poll right on the screen. So just lots of things for you to kind of sit down and brainstorm on, and, and 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 keep keep in mind while it's coming down the pike. Yep, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a great that's a great note too, the one you mentioned about things like sign up forms and things that pop up. Based on what I've read, I don't believe, Roberta, that any of those would be impacted um, because they're really looking for scripts that are third party ad scripts. That's how they kind of identify what's good and what's bad. But I do think for what it's worth, like those it's the experience that they're trying to avoid. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, some users saw that and kind of closed it right away or anything. So um, but I do think it's good to look at it, right? Everything should be looked at. Yeah. Good yep. to know. To know. Yep. Anybody have any questions? Has, or has anybody kind of started having the same, these conversations already? Yeah, folks, you're welcome to join the conversation. I think to preserve the audio quality, we're going to leave the lines muted. But if you want to talk, press star 7 on your phone, or you can also uh, submit a question via the Q&A tab in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And we actually have a couple of questions that have come in that way. So while we're waiting for anybody to unmute their line and uh, speak up, I'm just going to read those out. And certainly Justin, uh, Roberta, or Anil, if you want to take a crack at that, uh, please be our guest. Uh, but first question is, and I think this speaks to uh, the anxiety a lot of folks are feeling around Google actually approving this, is our sites still have not been reviewed in GWP ad tools. Is there any way we can request a review to help expedite our internal preparations? You can, but when you say when you request it, you're basically initiating the Google crawler to re-crawl your site. It's an automated system. It's a self-service kind of a thing. It's not like a service that Google would come to you and say, we're going to do it. So the way to do it, actually, if it's helpful, I'll put a second link here in the chat room, Matt, just so everyone can see it. This is the link directly to the Webmaster tool that has been added within Google Webmaster Tools. This thing, it's called, um, let me just get the naming right. Um, <clears throat> it's the ad experience report. So that link I put there, if you click on that and you're logged in to your webmaster tools, it'll take you directly to it. And this is basically how you can you start that process of you go in and you can kick off the um the request to have Google recrawl it. Sometimes it takes twenty four hours to, to kind of do it. But all you need to do this is is um just be have a, a webmaster account and to have your site verified with Google. And to do that, it's a, it's a straightforward verification. You add like a little HTML tag to your site and kind of you know, just re-verify it. Um, and that's really all it takes. Great. All right, great. Guys, we have a couple more questions that have come in via the chat. You're certainly welcome to submit any questions, comment via the Q&A tab, or unmute your line by pressing star 7. Uh, next question is, how is Google going to measure ad density? That's going to change based on screen size, and add unit size. I believe they have different rates between mobile and web. I can, I can double check that on the site and see if they have anything listed here. Let's see. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's a great question because the, the, like, the density kind of changes on the fly, right, with, based on what you're looking at. But um, you know, just to give you a little bit of what they've got here, again, feel free that first link has some exact percentages for you, but just to read what they've got here, you know, for mobile anyway, they have a very specific one is that 
you know, they're, they're looking for you know, 50% single column ad density and 35% single column ad density on some things. But I like the visuals that go along with it, I think, are the best way to see it because the visual kind of gives you a, a clear indication on how much of the screen they want to be taken up by your ad versus content. You know, so for me, the visual is the best indicator, those little like infographics they have there. I wouldn't expect anybody to go in and actually measure right, page percentages or anything, but I think you get a good sense based on how big those ads are on the page. All right, good. Folks, I'm going to share the link in a moment. We just have a couple other questions that have come in. Uh, next question, if your site is showing not reviewed in the ad report within Search Console, uh, what does that mean? Um, I assume if it's not run yet, then you might have just done this for the first time. That's usually what you see when you go there for the very, very first time and you've never clicked into the report. So once you're in there, um, there's a second link. And let me make sure, again, I give you the exact words on what it is. <clears throat> I think one of them says desktop and one of them says mobile when you go to that page. It's on the left side. And if you click desktop, it kind of initiates the report. So if you check back in 24 hours, you should see some results there. Justin or anybody else, do you have any suggestions on the type of ads to replace with interstitials or pre-stitials? I think a lot of people are expecting a little bit of backlash from their advertisers and don't necessarily have an alternative to propose to them at this point. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, I think our sales teams are facing that too. Because we, we actually specifically run welcome ads on our site frequently. And... Um, you know, I, I can only tell you the conversation that they've had with me is that I think they're feeling the same nervousness to it. They're actually not canceling all their campaigns, and I think we're going to go the route, you know, Roberta mentioned, which is we're just going to start to, you know, play with the thresholds on day one and just see how much we're impacted and not. But, you know, my advice to them is the same as everyone here, is that if it does become a problem and you guys are outselling that ad and it's running every day, you know, you want to flag that right now for your sales team. Make sure they understand these are not ads that are really – going to be, you know, uh, throughout the years, ad, ad standards changed, right? There's been a lot of ads in the past that were used that kind of are no longer today. And, and I expect these ads to fall in line somewhere throughout the year. If, if this becomes a bigger issue, ad, you know, pop-up welcome ads might be a thing of the past. Mm, yeah. Agreed. So Maybe Justin, for the better? Uh, you know? I don't know. Justin, quick question for you. So from your perspective in terms of what Google is uh, kind of doing, are they crawling and reviewing our sites and giving us feedback based on a Chrome browser type, or are they seeing the sites in terms of holistic view uh, across all the browser types? No, I think that's a great question. I have to imagine it's not the latter, that it is specific to Chrome, right? It's Google, so they, you know, they dominate the space. But I've got to say, obviously, our, at least for us, our, our Chrome numbers are quite high. Um, so obviously it's, it's important. We want our Chrome users to be super clean. And I would actually expect be Google being Google that it's only a matter of time that other browsers will update following these same conventions. And, and that's happened before with other Google type experiences when it comes to ads. So um, you know, I think for me yeah. it would be the first, the first kind of domino to fall. But it could take time, right? That could take you know, another two years for other browsers like Firefox to kind of adopt that same thing just because Chrome says that they're not going to, you know, you get a little flag saying the Chrome experience is, is deteriorated, it might be exactly the same in Firefox. And if you're a site that you're getting a predominantly large amount of traffic from, you know, Microsoft Edge and Internet Explorer and Firefox and otherwhere, you know, this might not impact you very much. And, and some ad systems, you know, are smart enough to not display those ads in certain browsers. So you might want to just take a look at some of the capabilities of your ad serving platform you know, I know if anyone's using DoubleClick, you know, for publishers, the Google, um, you know, served ad platform, I believe they do have the ability to do that and simply say you don't want to serve ads on certain browsers, you know, which, which might be a nice way to sort of delay, you know, any yeah, problem. Yeah, so from, uh, from our perspective at Haymarket, we're, we're, our remediation plan has multiple points to it, right? We are, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, even for us, uh, Chrome is by far the leader in terms of browser types uh, of what we're dealing with. So we're yeah. kind of narrowing our remediation plan against uh, Google Chrome, 
and kind of saying, okay, so for Chrome browser type, you know, here's the different types of ads that we can possibly surface. Instead yep. of uh, doing what we call pre which kind of looks like a pop-up in terms of Google's definition, we're kind of looking at alternatives to do uh, sort of a post uh if you will, right? You know, once you yeah, try exactly. to read the page yeah. or go to the second, things of that sort. Um, one question I had was, uh, you know, from our perspective, there is an educational exercise that we have to go through with our advertiser. Um, at the end of the day, these pre slash pop-up ads uh, probably have the best numbers across all of the different type of ad, ad, ad types. Um, and if we're going to try to get away from that and try to shy away from uh, signing up new contracts against it, I would love to be able to come back with uh, more either research material or something coming out from us as a group at Connective to say, you know, here are sort of the industry, here's what Google is doing, here's what industry is headed, and we're really trying to share, you know, go away from these pop-up style type of ads just because we're going to get more and more uh, dinged either from Google Now or other browser yeah. types as they're kind of following, following suit with it. Love to be able to quote additional materials, uh, especially as we're doing an educational exercise even with our advertisers um, against the stuff. Yeah, I imagine there's going to be a lot more. Like, actually, there's a lot of material online. I'd be happy to share just you know some links with the group and see if there's anything helpful that you know you guys can use when you're talking with your advertisers. But I do expect that because this isn't happened yet and it's still another month away. Like, I think everyone's kind of just guessing. You know, that's sort of my take on it. Is until it actually happens, it's really hard to say. Like, I I hate to be the person to say you know everyone should jump and everyone just kind of jumps. But you kind of have to look at it and see you know what the impact is before we go too far with it. But I but I agree with you. I think the one thing that a lot of sites do, especially with that kind of model, because we have that same thing, those interstitial ads, like peop they sell very well, it's still a hot item, we have a lot of inventory sold to run it, and we're really not changing it yet. But I, I imagine those are the kind of things people will look at of, you know, of bending the rules a little bit, right? It's kind of like the nature of the beast where, you know, if Google says we don't want it, you know, blocking your screen when you first hit the site, maybe you can delay it for 10 seconds and have it show up a little bit later and not be as intrusive or, but I do expect there to be a lot more on this topic in the next month as you know, advertisers run into this and start looking at some creative solutions. And, and like I said, I think it would be a great follow-up you know, for us here as a group to see what everyone's doing once this does happen. Um, and I'd be happy to share with you, you know, our results when we see it. Yeah, likewise, we can do the same. Folks, just an FYI, we're going to distribute the link that Justin mentioned before. We're going to send that to everybody who's participating today. We'll make sure you get that. Uh, I've typed it in. You've also seen uh, half the agenda I'm preparing anyway, so this is a pretty manual process. You can ignore that. But the, the link is google.com slash webmasters slash tools slash ad dash experience. And again, we're going to email that to everyone as well. Great. Great topic. Very pertinent. Additional questions, comments? All right. We can move along. We're almost on our wrap up. I'll flip over to the next slide. All right, we're up to topic jam now. Um, or was that our topic jam? I don't know if Jerry, you want to jump back in? Well, I think we can um, jump into topic jam to see if there are other items top of mind. And also, as everyone knows, we're always looking for good ideas for topics for upcoming meetings. So think about pain points, opportunity, technologies you're looking at and would like some help assessing. The floor is open to the committee. Just a reminder, hit star seven to unmute your line. All right. So if you think of something later on, you can certainly, um, you know, email Jerry or I, or, um, and we'll make sure we uh, discuss the topics and uh, put anything on as a new topic jam for the next meeting. Um, always, always welcome to hear your feedback as well. Great. Thanks, okay. Roberta. Um, now let's move on to our final uh, topic uh, around Connective, just to alert you to some great things that are happening. Um, Matt has been uh, working up a series of webinars for the year ahead. Matt, 
I know you have one on uh, January 25th. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how AL can trans AI can transform customer management for publishers? Sure. We're going to be, as the title suggests, talking a little bit about how AI is starting to be used by publishers as a customer management and also an audience management tool. So you're going to get a little more information specifically on how that really can be plugged in with existing systems, what you can use it for, uh, and uh, what sort of data you're going to be able to gather from that as well, what sort of functions and responsibilities you can offload to AI now, and we your team can really focus uh, going forward. So that's free to members. As many members, as many uh, members of your team um, can join. So we encourage you to be part of that. You can reach out to Matt or me for more info. And then on January 30th, we have the GDPR Primer Part Two. Obviously, the new EU data privacy regula uh, regulations are top of mind for everybody. So that'll be Carl Schoender, who is our Senior Director for International Public Policy, sharing his expertise. Matt, anything else on the webinar um, horizon that we should know about? No. Okay. So the NEALs are underway. Submissions have been made by many of your companies, and uh, we're in part one of the judging. Just a reminder that that uh, celebratory awards luncheon will be April 5th in New York City. I hope all of you are finalists, and I hope all of you are winners. But uh, we, it's always an exciting time of year for us. So. That's it for me, Matt. Anything else you want to add about what's going on around Connective? Uh, no, not right now. Frankly, there's a lot going on right in the back end there. Yes, exactly. Um, Roberta, Justin, any final thoughts as we wrap up today? No, I think no, this is a great you. topic, though. Yeah. yeah, it's a good topic. Thank you, Bethany, for joining us today. You know, obviously, we're looking for people to step up to the plate to uh, you know, just give us maybe 30 minutes of your time and help out with a with a topic or a presentation or something, um, you know, we're always looking for the assistance. So, and it, and it makes the group more dynamic. So, I hope people step forward. And that's it. Absolutely. Oh, great. Well, thanks so much, Bethany and Neil. Thanks for your voice on Google, and of course, Justin and Roberta. Always appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Matt. Bye, bye. Great. Bye, Thanks, guys. Everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.